like to talk to you a little bit about your mind, and in particular, the outsourced mind. And I want to talk to you about challenging two assumptions that we have when we talk about issues of digital economies and how our minds work. The first is that we aren't cyborgs. And I'm here to tell you that we already are. Because if you're like me, most of the telephone numbers, your memory is actually managed by your external brain, right? And the only telephone number I think I can remember offhand is my childhood telephone number. The other thing is that if you've gotten here by ways, you've outsourced your ability to make decisions to this app. The second assumption I'd like to challenge is that technology makes or improves our decisions. And that is what I do all day at MIT, where I run experiments to understand how people's just decision makings improve or are suffering based on technology. <laughs> so I'd like to start with an image that's a pretty classic representation of the human mind. It's an iceberg. And here's the thing about the human mind. It's incredible, right? And it can do so much, but at the same time, it's limited. The the tip of the iceberg, as you know, is the small part of the iceberg. And the human mind uh, has the tip of the iceberg with regard to the conscious mind. That is, you can only consciously process about as much information as fits on a post-it note. So you're hearing me say post-it note, you're seeing a picture of an iceberg. But really, much of the heavy lifting and the work is done beneath the surface of the iceberg or your subconscious mind. And that's where your NASA supercomputer is thinking about what you're going to eat, processing and encoding information that you were exposed to earlier today, or noticing things that are really uh, not important, but that are actually affecting how you view me, like the fact that I'm a woman or a woman of color. Now, here's the thing about the human mind. Although it's the original computer and it's pretty fantastic, it is limited. And as a result, we are prone to bias because we can only process or attend to so much information at any given time. And as a result, we outsource many decisions to computers to improve our choice. And so this picture here uh, of the woman deciding between using her brain or her external brain in the computer is a little bit of a misrepresentation because we are increasingly becoming more intimately involved with computers and becoming increasingly less conscious of when we dole out tasks to artificial intelligence or when we do them ourselves. This homo economicus never really existed and perhaps exists even less now because although we fancy ourselves rational thinkers, we know that we're not. And we also know increasingly that computers are not necessarily rational either. So let me show you some research from an experiment that I've run at MIT. Let's imagine here that you want to become even more intelligent than you already are, which, of course, we know requires the suspension of disbelief. And if you want to boost your cognitive ability, you've decided to purchase a product that purports to do this. In this particular example, you've purchased Brain Age, which is actually a real product. You may have also heard of Lumosity, which sort of does mental calisthenics to improve your mental acuity. Now, you've decided to purchase this product. It's a digital product. And you can purchase this product brought to you by MIT or brought to you by the online school of the University of Phoenix. Now, if you're like most people, you may have an ongoing preference, and that preference may be toward MIT. And in fact, that's what we found in our experiments. We had people use the product, train with it, and then we tested them with regard to their performance. Here's where the human mind is incredible, but also limited at the same time. Research on that very same iceberg has shown that Things like brands activate all kinds of associations in our minds and can lead us to suboptimal decisions. So for example, other experiments have shown that people who used a pen with the name MIT on it felt more intelligent. <laughs> or in an experiment, people were given wine, and in one randomly assigned condition, they received wine bottles that said made in France, and in the other condition, the wine bottle said made in North Dakota. The identical wine was rated as less delicious in the North Dakota condition. So you may think where I'm going with this, if you're familiar with placebo effects. The brain's or our mind's expectations play tricks on us. And those expectations can lead to different outcomes in terms of performance. So 
what do you think is going to happen when we give people these products and we have them trained? Turns out there is a difference in performance. Unfortunately, for those of us at MIT, there's a reverse placebo effect. People performed worse in the condition when they were asked to train and use the MIT branded product, even though it was identical. So given the fact that the research team, we were all at MIT, we were a little bit confused and potentially thought we made a huge mistake by going to MIT. So we did some other research to figure out, well, maybe the associations with this particular brand aren't as strong or aren't what we expected. And in fact, people do believe that MIT has high prestige versus the other condition, and they also expected higher efficacy. So this was a little bit of a head scratcher. Why are we seeing these results? And even though the people in the MIT condition performed worse, they were willing to pay 35% more for this identical product. So what's happening here? You may be thinking of some alternative explanations, one of which is that perhaps people worked less hard in the MIT condition. They figured they had more firepower on their side, so they had to expend less effort. Not the case, equal across all conditions. And perhaps maybe you think people spent more time or were, were more deliberate in the University of Phoenix condition. Not true, no difference across conditions there either. So we decided to do another experiment. And this time we said, OK, let's use language learning software. And let's use a fictional language that no one could possibly know or have a, an advantage with. And we used the language from the movie Avatar, which is called Navi, which my PhD postdoctoral associate was fluent in. And <laughs> no judgment. And he programmed a Rosetta Stone type language learning software for Navi. And once again, we randomly assigned people to two conditions, MIT or the University of Phoenix. And we measured their subjective outcomes after they used the product. How did you feel afterward? In the MIT condition, people felt better prepared. Mind you, this is a digital product. They are using it in their homes. There are no lab influences here. This is technology that equals the playing field, so to speak, in that it's a democratic way for people to gain access to this educational software. And when we asked about subjective outcomes with regard to how much they'd be willing to pay for this wonderful product, once again, the willingness to pay was higher in the MIT condition. But here's their objective performance. Once again, they performed worse in the MIT condition. What's happening here? There's something that goes on with human beings called social comparison. We can't help it. We walk into a room and we scan the room for people who are like us, whether it be according to gender, race, or other markers. It's an automatic process that takes place with human beings. And just because we're using technology, doesn't mean this process is ameliorated. In fact, I would argue, it may actually increase as we outsource more of our cognitive thinking to technology that is programmed by biased human beings. When we are in a setting where standards are high and you expect high standards in this context, certainly that could motivate you. But those high standards in the presence of social comparison where you feel psychologically close to the focal reference group can affect your performance in that your performance can start to assimilate toward that goal. However, in the presence of high standards, if you feel psychologically distant, then you will experience contrast effects and your performance will suffer accordingly. This is really important, not only for digital technology, but for educational institutions and organizations that attempt to have inclusivity. When you have a person like me, who's the first person in her family to go to college from immigrants, and you go to a prestigious school, certainly you worked hard to get there and you belong there. But your mind may be telling you that you don't. And in fact, the more that you are exposed 
to those high standards. The more signals you see of that achievement and that standard, the more you may actually struggle in this reverse placebo effect. Now, this doesn't just happen in the educational realm. This happens with health behaviors, where we see these reference or focal points and we decide whether we're psychologically close or distant, and that affects our behavior. And in social media, this is even more amplified. You may be familiar with the Ice Bucket Challenge or with the it's Get, It Gets Better campaign for LGBT youth or with Movember to raise awareness for prostate cancer. But what you may not be familiar with is that all of this that's percolating in our digital extended selves, our social media lives, is affecting the way in which we behave, even in health. For instance, this imagery here versus this imagery versus this imagery for the identical disease with the identical copy has very different effects on people who would aim to support disease research or the patients themselves. We did an experiment where we had a fictional disease called Carlson's disease, and we randomly assigned people to either be in the patient condition or in the potential donor condition. I should mention that none of our participants admitted to having Carlson's disease, so that's good because it's fake. <laughs> and interestingly, what we found is when these things are going virally through social media, for instance, and amplified te by technology, our biases are still at play. For instance, here you see low efficacy poses. These images are most effective in getting people to donate money, possibly because of something like emotional contagion. You see someone looking sad, forlorn, pitiful, and you want to stop that sad feeling, and you give money, take my money, make me feel better. You may also run for the remote and change the channel when those kinds of advertisements come on, right? But when you see imagery like this, power poses, you may be familiar with that term, these images are most effective in getting patients to comply with physician advice. And in these experiments, patients in the condition were more likely, with these kinds of poses, to wear medical alert jewelry that would be visible to other people, to ask people for help, to tell people at their workplaces that they need uh, a change in their schedule, to ask for uh, amended recipes if they were on a special diet. These kinds of things that have huge implications for health are aided by the imagery that we see in technology. So is the outsourced mind more rational? I think the answer is it depends. And we really only started to understand this cyborg existence that we have, where our memory is in our back pocket in our phones, or our phones are telling us how to go and where to go. Now, when we think about the outsourced mind, what I want you to think about is that we're becoming less conscious in having an outsourced mind. And that's important because, as in this case, when you have computers creating the perfect face, the perfect image of beauty, this was created by artificial intelligence. What does that reflect? Does that reflect what true beauty is or what biases we hold as a result? And what does that mean if you don't look like this? Or if you do a Google search, and you may be familiar with this, for three black teenagers, why does the algorithm show you these images but if you do the identical search for three white teenagers, you see these images. Technology is amazing and can improve our decision making in all of our journeys, whether it be how you spend your money, how you take care of your health, or maybe even how you got here from your home. But what we need to be careful of is to challenge the assumption that this technology improves our decision making, reduces our irrational thinking, and that we consciously make a decision between our own brains and our outsourced brains. So tonight, when you go home, I'd like you to think more consciously when you make your next decision about how much you've been leaning on technology and how you can be more conscious about thinking about your outsourced brain to reduce the same biases that we hope to reduce in the human brain. Make the unconscious conscious. That's the best way to combat bias. And if you do so, 
My hope is not only will you improve your performance, but you'll also improve the happiness in your life as well. Thank you.